It's uh, my pleasure to be speaking about this topic today, um, which will be focused on uh, innovations in living kidney donation. I uh, don't have any uh, disclosures at this stage. Uh, my objectives for today's talk are to review um, living donor uh, kidney transplant, both from a benefit to, it has for recipients, as well as the potential risk it poses to donors. Uh, I'd like to discuss innovation that has occurred and uh, to identify barriers that exist to providing access to all of our patients um, uh, with uh, receiving living donor kidney transplants. So uh, the incidence of end-stage renal disease has been increasing with time as we have a rise in uh, medical conditions, uh, including diabetes and hypertension, which are leading causes. These are Canadian statistics from Kaihai, which show the various initial modalities for renal replacement therapy, mostly being hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and the levels of preemptive kidney transplants are, have remained relatively uh, steady. Renal transplant is established as a life prolonging therapy for patients with end stage renal disease. This was a seminal New England Journal of Medicine paper um, in 1999, displaying the relative risk of death related to renal transplant, which is increased shortly after transplant related to perioperative mortality. However, this risk becomes equal to that of staying on dialysis at around 100 days after transplant and thereafter the pe patient benefits from improved life expectancy. Our healthcare system is also in a crisis as we know and kidney transplant is a, one of the only cost saving procedures that we do. Uh, David Axelrod uh, published an economic assessment of the various complexities of kidney transplant and found that all forms of kidney transplant were cost effective. Um, uh, relative to dialysis. Living donor kidney transplant down here is the most effective cost-saving strategy um, among all uh, forms of transplant um, for end-stage renal disease. And in a Canadian paper um, recently published, uh, modeling the healthcare cost savings based on a system in Nova Scotia, uh, they found that living donor transplant saves annually over $23,000 per patient um, whereas a deceased donor a kidney transplant saves um, uh, on the order of about nearly 19,000 um, annually per patient after a transplant. However, the, the access to kidney transplant really is the late, rate limiting step, as we know. Median wait times in Canada have been improving over the last decade, um, but still wait times for all adult patients that are on dialysis um, are 3.3 years, uh, slightly improved from 10 years ago. Um, at 3.7 years. This is an average, so patients with blood type B or O um, are waiting longer. And relative to other solid organs which are transplanted, the number of kidney transplants we perform are unable to keep up with the waiting list. And so this has resulted in 105 deaths um, for patients on dialysis while awaiting kidney transplant in the last year alone. Here we see some of the, the numbers of transplants that, are done, that were performed in 2021 across Canada, broken down by province and living versus deceased donor um, organs. When we compare this on a per million population scale, we can see that British Columbia really is punching above its weight um, for the total number of kidney transplants that we are performing. Um, but this is predominantly based on our uh, high deceased donor um, uh, rates whereas our living donor numbers are quite similar to those across the country. And so I think there's still room for us to um, uh, focus on this area. We know that living donor kidneys have superior outcomes when compared to deceased donor organs. Um, and this is why it's considered the gold standard treatment for patients with end-stage renal disease. It allows patients to avoid the time waiting on the, on the list and for patients to obtain a preemptive transplant from a living donor um, allows them to avoid the impaired quality of life and potential risks of being on dialysis. This, this was a study that illustrates the improvements in outcomes for both living donors and deceased donors um, that have occurred um, over time. 
And this is likely as a result of a number of factors, including our improved understanding and ability to match donors with recipients and uh, the perioperative and postoperative management of, of transplant patients. So as surgeons who perform this operation, uh, it's uh, imperative that we are able to describe to our patients the risks of living kidney donation so that they can make an informed decision. I think we're quite familiar with at least the, the, the short-term risks related to uh, a nephrectomy, um, but this was a, a meta-analysis that um, uh, reviewed the literature in 2016, and it suggested that there's an overall mortality, 30-day mortality rate of uh, one in 10,000 patients. The rate of uh, conversion, this is for just focusing on laparoscopic donor nephrectomy. So the rate of conversion to open is around 1% and the potential need to go back with a re-intervention at some point um, in 30 days was at 0.6%. Um, intraoperative uh, complications can occur and occurred in 2.3% with most of these being bleeding related. And finally, complications can occur postoperatively as well in 7.3% again, mostly infection or bleeding uh, related. Now, I, I do think we have a pretty good understanding of the perioperative risks, but, um, and we can describe this well to our patients, but the potential long-term risks of a donor nephrectomy are less clear. And it's, it's a, I think it's a bit more difficult for us to give uh, patients a long-term uh, expectation. There've been a number of studies that have tried to quantify these risks, but many of them are really flawed in their, their methodology. Um, and have been retrospective up to date. This was an initial paper, again, in the New England Journal, um, evaluating 3,698 kidney donors um, for their risk of progression to end-stage renal disease and found that the risk was, in fact, lower than the general population at uh, 180 cases per million population per year. Um, this was a, a survival curve, so this is um, uh, uh, death, um, plotted with a mean follow-up of 12.2 years. And um, you can see that donors, if anything, fare better than um, the controls that they used in this study. But um, the main criticism we have here is that um, the control group is not very well matched. Um, we know that kidney donors are, by definition, the healthiest patients in the population. And furthermore, they undergo intensive screening as a part of the donor evaluation process. And so we can't necessarily expect them to have the same health risks as a general population. To address these uh, criticisms, um, this is a paper that uh, compared 96, 000, uh, over 96,000 kidney donors um, representing all of the kidney donors in the United States between 1994 and 2011. And uh, they compared them to 20,000 participants of a, um, a national health and nutrition examination survey um, this was a control group that was selected for healthy, screened participants um, with exclusion for patients that had contraindications to kidney donation. Uh, what they found was that there was an increased risk of end-stage renal disease um, on the order of 30 uh, per 10,000 patients. And while this is increased compared to healthy non-donors, uh, the absolute risk uh, is still relatively small and, in fact, is still less than the general population. Interestingly, when they broke down their data by ethnicity, um, Black, Hispanic, and, and white populations, um, there was uh, a higher rate of, um, of uh, end-stage renal disease uh, compared to, to white donors and non-donors as well. There's uh, other studies that have investigated this racial variation risk um, for end-stage renal disease, particularly in living donors, and while it's likely a multifactorial uh, component um, with other considerations, including the social determinants of health, um, there is a subset of African and American patients, at least, where there's a genetic variant that can exist within the lipoprotein ApoL1. And this may contribute to their increased risk of hypertensive nephrosclerosis. And so some programs in the United States, at least, have, have been utilizing or looking into the role for ApoL1 genotyping to further inform the donor evaluation process. What about the, the future risks to pregnancy for our female patients that might be, um, uh, may become pregnant after donation? This is actually a retrospective cohort study out of London, Ontario, where they compared a matched cohort of 85 female living kidney donors 
um, who underwent 131 pregnancies after donation to uh, a matched group of 510 um, healthy non-donors uh, who underwent 788 pregnancies. And this was uh, within their center. What they found was a, an increased risk of gestational hypertension and uh, preeclampsia at the order, on the order of about 11% in the donors versus 5% in the non-donor population. And so I think this is an important um, uh, information for us to disclose um, to uh, females with uh, potential uh, childbearing uh, potential when uh, considering the donor evaluation uh, process. As I've discussed, many of these studies are limited by being retrospective. Um, now, we do have a research group, including our own faculty member, uh, Dr. Guan, who have performed a prospective cohort study of uh, 1,042 living kidney donors that were recruited from 17 centers across Canada and Australia from 2004 to 2014. And they were compared with non-donor participants. These were patients that were either family members of the donors or were uh, presenting for donation, but were ineligible to donate due to blood group or cross-match incompatibility. And so seemed like a reasonable comparator. This was, uh, this was actually the paper that um, published on the protocol for this study um, and uh, how they were screening patients yearly for blood pressure, um, uh, renal function, albuminuria, um, quality of life and general health metrics. Um, and uh, the patient follow-up actually did conclude in 2021. So they were anticipating a median follow-up of seven years. And um, at this point, the data analysis is, under, is, un, is under, um, undergoing and the, uh, we, we expect some results perhaps in the next few years. And so this, may, this, this should be pretty um, crucial information that will help us inform our, our donors. Now, once a donor has identified themselves as being interested, um, the process itself can take uh, nine to 12 months um, for them to undergo the initial evaluation and further diagnostic and laboratory tests, um, as well as medical and surgical evaluation before they actually end up um, at the surgery. So when we're evaluating potential uh, living kidney donors, they need to be over the age of 18. They need to be willing to donate and of course, free of coercion or any financial compensation. A general recommendation is that GFR be greater than 90. Um, however, we do utilize a more individualized risk assessment that may allow for uh, certain donors uh, with a new GFR below this cutoff. And of course, there's a number of uh, contraindications, which I won't necessarily go through here, um, about that the uh, donor evaluation process aims to rule out. And uh, Kate Igo uh, provides guideline recommendations for the evaluation of kidney donors. Um, there's a number of tests here, um, but I wanted to focus in on the evaluation of, of GFR, um, where Kate Igo recommends a confirmatory measurement, either through a measured GFR using a, a filtration marker, or the measured creatinine clearance, which is based on a 24-hour urine measurement, or further enhanced uh, estimates of GFR using cystatin C. And locally, we, use, um, we typically use a confirmatory test with measured GFR um, at the time of nuclear medicine renal scan. And focusing on this, um, nuclear medicine renography is, has been the gold standard for assessing split renal function to, to assist with deciding which kidney to donate. We also use an arterial phase CT um, to evaluate donor anatomy in making this decision. But what if we could eliminate the need for nuclear medicine renography um, in order to streamline the donor evaluation process? We've already seen that there's been local impacts um, across Canada from a shortage of the radioisotope Technetium 99, which is used in the nuclear medicine scans. And um, CT renal volumetry has been proposed as a potential um, candidate for calculating renal volume really as a surrogate for split renal function. And in some cases, clinicians question the utility of the nuclear renography. For example, in this, in this patient that I present here, um, with a uh, rotation of the right kidney, the renal scan estimated that the split function was around 42 on the right to 58 on the left. Whereas with CT volumetry, we got a better understanding of the, uh, the true anatomy 
um, representing a more symmetric split of 48% on the right and 52 on the left. And so in this, this case that was presented, the patient actually underwent a left donor nephrectomy, which we typically um, prefer due to the shorter renal vein on the right side, um, which makes it um, more challenging. There, there have been a number of studies that have evaluated the and confirmed correlation between CT volumetry with renal nu uh, nuclear renography. And I, I liked this study because not only did it compare the two, but it compared the estimated split function with measured EGFR six months after donation. Um, what they found was a modest correlation between the initial CT volumetry and the nuclear renogram in determining the uh, assessment of split function. And they also showed that both modalities had strong correlation with the measured GFR post-donation. And in fact, the authors argue that um, CT volumetry was slightly superior to uh, nuclear renography in this respect. Again, these, are, these have all been retrospective studies, and so this may not be sufficient evidence at this point uh, to change our practice, but I think it's certainly thought-provoking. Pro Additionally, this was a recent study that uh, looked at how nuclear renography and CT volumetry um, do when they disagree with each other, at least in the dominance of left to right um, kidney um, they, they retrospectively, again, reviewed <clears throat> 853 living kidney donors. And what they found was actually there was discordance in, in a quite a large number of these patients, 39%. Um, but what they found was that uh, CT volumetry, so here, uh, here, and here, had, um, uh, were slightly more predictive of the post-donation renal function than the DTPA renal scan at one month, six months, and one year after transplant. And so they suggest that it may actually be the preferred modality. <clears throat> and so I bring this, this topic up when we're thinking about how we can reduce disincentives um, that exist for living donation. And uh, as all of these investigations add time, <clears throat> time and complexity to the donor process, if we can streamline the process, then we may be able to attract more living kidney donors who would otherwise um, uh, be disincentivized to, to participate. <clears throat> this was an interesting quality improvement project um, that was done in Northern Ireland where they have a single center transplant program. And uh, they switched to a one day comprehensive living donor evaluation where all of the, um, the battery of tests and the nephrology assessment uh, occurred on the same day and uh, they, they reported some pretty dramatic results. Prior to this though, their, their donor evaluation process could take up to two years and they struggled with um, considerably low um, population level uh, living donor um, uh, rates. So um, in order to, for this to have, they initiated it in 2010 and found a sustained increase in their living donor, the number of living donor transplants they were able to perform this obviously required significant collaboration between the transplant services as well as radiology lab, lab investigations and required more complexity with um, logistics. But I think it's just uh, an example of how uh, this can be done. So switching gears slightly, what about, what about any developments that have occurred in, in terms of surgical technique? Most donor nephrectomy operations are being performed pure laparoscopically or hand assist laparoscopically, but there's been an increasing interest in robotic donor nephrectomy. Um, you know, from my experience, when I was at a conference back in January in the, in the States, it's quite clear that the field of transplant is moving more and more towards an interest in robotics for both the renal transplant and the donor operation. Um, my impression is that they're, there's, they're using the robot more in the donor operation as they have, you know, quite unlimited access in the United States. And there's a desire for the transplant surgeons who may not have too much experience with robots so far to, to improve their, their comfort. And I wonder if the donor nephrectomy is, is, what the, is the case that they're using to learn, to learn on before they proceed to the recipient robotic transplant operation. So a lot of the data we have so far on this is, has been retrospective. This was, for example, this is a recent paper out of Switzerland, um, which found similar complication rates 
as well as warm ischemic time for the kidney between robotic and hand assist uh, uh, laparoscopic donor nephrectomy in the 176 patients that they included. They, they did find a shorter length of hospital stay, but um, you know, I kind of scratching my head because our laparoscopic donor nephrectomies are typically home between day two and day four. So this is quite a long hospital stay that they've reported in their, their laparoscopic donor group. And we'd expect something closer to the robotic group uh, locally. Um, and is it common with robotic surgery the, there's a longer operative time uh, related to the robot compared to laparoscopically? Uh, there was a Canadian study that was uh, done by the group at Western University in London uh, with Pat Luke and, and Alp Center, where they enrolled living donors prospectively um, to a trial comparing standard laparoscopy with robotic-assisted single-site um, surgery. Now, this was not a truly randomized uh, study as they couldn't really predict the robot availability. So in true Canadian fashion, basically the patient was received robotic surgery if the surgical robot was available on the date that they'd planned the surgery for. And as you can see here, the way that they did this was not with the single port robot, but they kind of jerry-rigged the Da Vinci SI to uh, be able to perform a single port through the gel port um, at a periumbilical region. When looking at their data, interestingly, operative time was not significantly different between the two groups. And they did include robot docking within the robotic group, but I wonder if their laparoscopic donor times are, are slightly longer than we'd anticipate. And certainly 240 minutes is, is longer than the 100, 160 minutes that were, was reported in this other study. Um, they also uh, reported on things like uh, perioperative outcomes, which were very similar. And uh, they use a visual analog pain scale to suggest that the robot had slightly lower pain scores and perhaps uh, less hydromorphone equivalents. But I think this is quite a small study and, and um, obviously has its significant limitations. Now, I just did want to give a, 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 a slight discussion around the idea of robotic kidney transplant, um, as it has been proposed as, one of, as being most effective if you're looking for a use case within the obese patient population in order to minimize the surgical morbidity. So moving our typical Gibson incision away from the, the panis fold in these obese patients is theorized to, uh, to reduce the risk of wound complications. And typically within the robot, the, the kidney still has to be brought into the abdomen. And so, you know, this, this incision could be done periumbilical or at a midline location. Um, where they theorize to reduce um, the potential risk for, for uh, skin and soft tissue infections and wound complications. This was the largest um, uh, retrospective uh, series that's been uh, published to date out of the University of Illinois in Chicago, and their experience with robotic kidney transplant uh, for over a 10-year period. They've done 239 on obese patients with a median BMI of 41 uh, what they found was median surgical time was 4.8 hours. They had a longer than we would typically anticipate a uh, warm ischemic time of 45 minutes. And, but very interestingly, their wound complication rate, at least as reported, was quite low at 3.8%. And if we compare this to a previous study by the same group where they compared with open kidney transplant, they found that the, the risk for surgical site infections was about 28% in the obese population. So this is quite a drastic reduction in that. And, you know, importantly, the other uh, short-term, I guess, graft survival outcomes were quite comparable to uh, UNOS data um, with a 93% graft survival at three years. So this is where, um, I guess, uh, some centers are moving towards, at least within this very um, specific population who may benefit from robotic transplant. So having kind of reviewed that, I would like to move on and discuss the innovations that have occurred in the realm of uh, the paired exchange program. Paired exchange kidney transplants typically available to patient to recipients who have living donors that may not be compatible with each other due to uh, ABO or HLA incompatibility. In this basic swap that you can see here, where the um, pairs are not directly compatible, um, donor A can donate to recipient B and donor B can donate to recipient A. This is really the, the simplest form. And as I'll get into in a moment, um, there's a more complex ways that we can match patients who are enrolled in the paired exchange 
in order to optimize the number of transplants that can be performed within a population. In this example, for a closed chain, um, where we can include multiple pairs, um, this increases the pool for potential matches. The algorithm for this, because it can get quite complicated, was actually um, uh, developed uh, out of game theory by Professor Alvin Roth, um, who actually was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2012 for his contributions to this particular field. Uh, this is the same algorithm that we actually use in the CARMS, uh, CARMS process as well. So it is familiar. Um, now, one of the limitations of a closed chain like this is that it relies on all the donors and recipients to be performed relatively simultaneously in order to reduce any risk of a break in the chain. If you can imagine in this scenario, if donor A donates to recipient B, but then if they're done non-simultaneously, donor B decides for whatever reason to back out, we, can, we can't hold the donors responsible or uh, obliged to, to continue to participate because it is an elective um, uh, uh, donation process. So if, if donor B decides to back out, then the chain is broken. And unfortunately, recipient A has now lost their living kidney donor, um, which is essentially their playing card, the, their ability to, to receive a living donor kidney. So um, this, the, for this reason, uh, closed chains are typically performed simultaneously. And with the number of logistics that can occur, um, it can become quite complicated. And so we typically limit the number of pairs in a closed chain to six. Now, um, when we have someone that's considered a non-directed altruistic donor, um, this is someone that does not have an intended recipient and they're, they're donating to anybody on the waiting list um, in order to, to, to improve um, their quality of life. Um, but this, this is actually an interesting scenario because it allows us to start what we call a domino paired exchange. Non-directed donors are very valuable um, to the paired exchange program because of the ability for them to initiate these domino exchanges. So um, for multiple reasons, the first being that when a, um, a recipient receives a kidney from a non-directed donor, um, this, this uh, chain um, has a lower chance of um, any of, or I guess the, the risk of a break in this chain is, is much less than with the closed, closed one. For example, if in this scenario, the non-directed donor donates to recipient A and their living donor decides to opt out, it's unfortunate for transplant recipient B because they don't get a kidney at this time, but they haven't lost their, their living donor yet. And so they could still uh, participate in a future paired exchange match. And so the risk of a break in the chain is less. And for this reason, um, these transplants can be done non-simultaneously. And this allows the chain to, to be perpetuated to much more than six potential pairs. The second benefit of this type of chain is that um, at the end of the chain, uh, a living donor kidney can be given to somebody who's on, potentially on the waiting list. Um, and these are often patients that are prioritized um, with either highly sensitive uh, panel reactive antibody titers or children um, who we give priority to. And so the ability for a non-directed donor to participate in this uh, domino exchange allows their kidney to, um, you know, re uh, respectively increase the number of kidney transplants that can be performed uh, instead of just directing direct, uh, instead of donating directly to a single recipient. In Canada, the pair kidney paired donation program uh, is run by the uh, Canadian Blood Services. And uh, we see here the number of transplants that have been performed by the Paired Exchange Program since it was started, in, I think, in 2011. Um, and you can see here that the most significant result in number of transplants that we've been able to perform are as a result of the non-directed donors um, who are able to start domino chains. Now, the acceptance of shipping living donor kidneys has also improved the logistics um, uh, as well as decreased the potential barriers to um, living donation. Canada was actually quite slow to adopt this model of shipping kidneys. And up until the paired exchange program was halted by the COVID-19 pandemic just a couple of years ago, uh, the donor would typically be flown to the, to the hospital where they would receive, where the recipient would be receiving the kidney. However, in the United States, they've had the model of shipping living donor kidneys for a number of years. And so they've actually been able to publish on their experience with shipping kidneys um, and comparing them to non-shipped living donor kidneys. 
Um, this was, a, again, a retrospective study. Um, but uh, as expected, the median cold ischemic time was quite a bit longer in the ship donor population, ship kidney population rather, to those that were non-shipped and performed locally. Um, and what they found was there was actually a slightly slight increased uh, risk of delayed graft function, which is by definition the requirement for uh, transplant within seven days after of, after transplant. Oh, sorry, the need for dialysis within seven days after transplant. And um, with each additional hour of cold ischemic time, this was associated with a 5% increased odds of DGF, which is, uh, which is a, a small amount, but is still a significant finding. But most importantly, the, the graft failure rates um, between these groups, both on an all-cause and death-censored um, graft failure, um, there was no, no significant difference between kidneys that were shipped and those that were not shipped from living donors. And so this, this data provided reassurance that shipping living donor kidneys would be reasonable. This was an extension of that study where the same, similar group um, took it one step forward and they, they looked at the extremes of living donors, both uh, age over 65 and for cold ischemic times that were longer than 16 hours, which, you know, when we compare that to our deceased donor population, these kind of cold ischemic times are pretty typical. Um, but what they found was that um, within this group, there was no significant difference between the risk for graft failure um, after transplant for whether there's a, the prolonged cold ischemic time or whether donor age was over 65. And so this is just further um, data to kind of support the idea of shipping living kidneys. Now, um, a further development that's kind of existed in the paired exchange uh, paradigm would be the, that concept of advanced donation. And this is an idea that allows donors to overcome the concept of chronological incompatibility, where the donor um, may uh, benefit from donating at a time that works well for them ahead of the intended recipient's transplant operation. It allows the living donor to choose a time that, that is more convenient for them to donate and um, this can be on the order of you know, days, months, or even a couple of years ahead of the intended recipient's operation. But the other benefit is that the donor now participates in the paired exchange as a non-directed donor and can, can initiate a domino chain, which as I've already kind of explained, are quite uh, beneficial to the entire population. In Canada, we don't currently offer this uh, advanced donation program, at least as far as I'm aware. Um, but in the United States, the National Kidney Registry offers this with, with no guarantee to the intended recipient that they can actually develop a match because of the, the limitations with matching for kidneys. And an extension of the advanced donation program is this idea of uh, kidney vouchers, um, which I think is easiest to kind of uh, conceptualize based on this example that was uh, the first um, uh, that sparked this initial idea at, the, at UCLA. Um, with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Veal, who's a Canadian urologist and quite a pioneer in the field. Um, in this example, there was a four-year-old who had a solitary kidney with um, a chronic kidney disease and um, was given an estimated 10 or 15 years before he may require a kidney transplant. He had a 64-year-old grandfather who's healthy and wishing and willing to donate, but he was worried by the time his grandson would progress to end-stage renal disease, that he himself would no longer be considered a, a potential donor. So what they proposed was he would donate his living donor kidney to, uh, some, to the paired exchange program. And um, in return, his grandson could receive a voucher to redeem when or if he requires a transplant in the future. And so in this case, he was able to um, uh, initiate three additional transplants through a domino chain. And, um, and this was successful. Now, uh, Jeffrey Veal's group um, has published the, uh, their experience with the, the voucher program uh, since it was initiated in 2014. And they published on the, the six patients that have um, gone on to redeem their vouchers. Um, and, you know, from the time that they initiated the redemption to the time that they got transplanted, they were all feasible and done within 155 days. Um, the time between uh, the initial donation from their living donor to redemption was up to nearly three years. Um, and so you can see that this would uh, promote an increased supply of living donor kidneys into the population ahead of um, the potential need for patients that could uh, be receiving the kidneys. 
Now, one of the concerns with the voucher program has been the potential inability to cover the number of recipients that may redeem these vouchers in the future. Um, and this, this is especially important because it's, it's a relatively new concept. So this was a study that looked at um, simulating the voucher program over a period of 50 years um, using various potential growth um, scenarios. So um, I won't go through all of the scenarios that they modeled, but really the most extreme example would be when they have a rapid rise in donors followed by a rapid decline in donors. So you worry that the supply may decrease later on, um, followed by a, a quite a steady rise in the number of uh, recipients that would be redeeming their vouchers. And even in this extreme example, what they found was that there should still be sufficient coverage um, or supply of living donor kidneys to cover those number of patients that would be redeeming the kidneys in the future. And so um, uh, this, this, this kind of provides some, um, at least reassurance that the program uh, should at least in theory work. Now, the last kind of topic I'd focus on in the paired exchange realm is the idea of including compatible pairs to the paired exchange program. As I mentioned previously, we typically offer paired exchange when there's incompatibility between the donor and their intended recipient. But what about, uh, but is there any advantage to including these compatible pairs into the paired exchange program, both from the, the, from the recip that individual recipient's level and on a population level. Uh, so there are some instances where actually where it may be beneficial for these uh, recipients to enter the, the paired exchange program um, in order to obtain a better matched living kidney in terms of maybe size, uh, age, or if there's a, a CMV or EBV mismatch between the, the donor and recipient. So this was another simulation study um, where they calculated the increased number of uh, potential matches that could occur for those in the paired exchange program with incompatible pairs and how this would improve their rates of matching um, as you increase the number of compatible pairs that are brought into the paired exchange program. And as expected, it would significantly increase the number of potential matches within this uh, program. This is a, a, a real life um, data, I guess, based on this model where um, the Mayo Clinic published on their 10-year experience with incorporating compatible um, pairs. And they performed 332 transplants within this program, including 54 compatible pairs. And um, they identified that those recipients, at least those that had entered for age or size mismatch reasons, that they were able to receive kidneys which were on average 18 years younger than they would have been if they were to go directly with their donor. And they had lower um, what's called LKDPI scores. And this is essentially an index for predicting the long-term survival of the allograft. And so what we see here is that um, there's, there's a, uh, there, that these uh, recipients by entering as a compatible pair um, can potentially receive some personal benefit as well as improving the, the general population of, of uh, paired exchange. So overall, I guess we, we, I think I've pre presented that there's a number of ways that we can manipulate the paired exchange program or increase the number of pairs that, are, that enter the paired exchange in order to improve the number of matches that ultimately come out of this exchange. Now, uh, I'd like to finish up by identifying some of the barriers that exist um, to improving access to living donor kidney transplant. We've discussed like a number of innovations that have occurred, which may play a role in improving the number of living donor transplants that we can perform. But one additional area, which could arguably be the most impactful for improving um, our rates would be improving access to kidney transplant. As we know, social determinants of health are, play a role in all outcomes in, in medicine and transplant is no different in arguably um, these differences are likely ampli amplified, especially when we're considering the use of living donor kidneys. Um, this is a review that identifies that exist at different levels, um, both uh, at the provider level, recipient level, all the way up to population levels, as well as at different um, stages along the process for transplant recipients, starting at being able to identify potential living donors in the transplant evaluation process or donor evaluation process, as well as in the, the delivery of transplant and post-transplant care. Minority populations are particularly disadvantaged when it comes to kidney transplant. 
Um, this is a review of uh, Canadian populations um, with Canadian authors here um, that identified that South Asian, East Asian, Black patients who have end-stage renal disease are 30% less likely to receive a kidney transplant overall. And uh, more staggering is the rate of 57 to 75% less likely to receive a living donor kidney transplant when they're compared to their um, uh, white patients who have end-stage renal disease. This is uh, Canadian data from, again, Kaihai, showing that Aboriginal patients are themselves at higher risk of end-stage renal disease at baseline. And once they do reach end-stage renal disease, um, they are much less likely to receive a kidney transplant, which is the dark blue box here, um, compared to um, non-Aboriginal patients. And so there's clearly um, a number of barriers that are uh, set up against this population. This is a, um, a paper that was published by a, a number of our colleagues here at St. Paul's and BGH um, who looked at actually American data from the scientific registry of transplant patients and compared it with US census data in order to compare living donation rates um, based on gender and income quartiles. The first finding that I'd, I'd like to highlight is that living donation rates decrease with lower income quartiles. And, you know, there's a significant financial disincentive to donors um, when they have to take time off of work and with additional expenses. Um, now, interestingly, the other finding of this, this paper was that uh, women are 44% more likely to uh, donate a kidney than, than men are. And this difference is actually greatest among spousal donation, where women are 148% more likely to donate to their spouse than uh, men are. And clearly, there's a, there's a number of factors at play here, um, both from a societal and, and um, um, societal kind of context. So um, what can we do to address these barriers that, that we've identified? Obviously, removing financial disincentives to transplant will allow more people to participate um, who may be interested in being living donors. There's funding available to uh, currently to help support this, but um, it doesn't really match the opportunity costs that donors have um, when you consider things like missed work. Um, so the Canadian Society of Transplant, and I think the American societies as well, have uh, started to propose this idea of a, a recognition called the Circle of Excellence, where it recognizes uh, companies that are committed to providing paid time off for their employees if they were to go ahead with donation. And so this kind of gets at stigma and societal uh, level expectations for um, living kidney transplant. Um, to address the social and kind of cultural factors that are at play within minority populations, we need to engage with these communities in order to understand their needs and develop specific strategies to support them from education to donor outreach um, and there's an initiative through the BC Transplant led by Dr. Jack Gill at St. Paul's called the Bridge to Transplant Initiative. And I think so far it's just been um, uh, just starting out. So they're kind of on the initial implementation process, but they're aiming to refine the donor evaluation process with concepts like the single day uh, donor assessment model that I, that I uh, suggested earlier, um, as well as increasing the support that's available to specific Indigenous communities. So kind of in summary, there, there's been a number of examples, both at a local level and a national level, where we're attempting to break down these barriers, but I do think we still have clearly a long way to go. Um, and so uh, I'd like to end here, um, and I can open up to, to any questions that, that people may have, um, but I'd like to thank Dr. Guan. He helped me in preparation of this presentation. Uh, as well as uh, our other um, uh, staff in, involved in transplant for their, their mentorship. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll open the floor to any, any questions at this point.